Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hope Church family, a really warm welcome to you. And if you're here connecting in, maybe for the first time, we're so glad that you're joining us this morning. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm one of the pastors of Hope Church Rhonda. And I really hope that this week, despite the difficult circumstances, you've been able to enjoy the good news of Jesus's death and resurrection and all that means to us that means we can know God and have hope forevermore. And so um, this morning is going to be a little bit different. We're actually going to be joining with our Advance uh, family. Uh, Advance churches all across the world this morning are going to be joining together and receiving encouragement um, from the book of Philippians together. Um, If you're not sure about what Advance is, Advance is a movement of churches, a global movement of churches across four or five continents, uh, we partner together for the good of the gospel. And as a church, as Hope Church Rhonda, we don't want to exist just as an island isolated from the rest of the body of Christ. And advance is the way that we're able to uh, be receive support and strengthening from other places and other churches and be encouraged with good news stories from all around the world and also to be connected in to world mission because the Great Commission goes far beyond uh, Tonopandi or Triorki or the Rhonda Valley. It goes to the ends of the earth. And so advance is our way of connecting ourselves to global mission. And this morning we're going to be hearing from PJ Smythe who leads the global team and he's going to open God's word to us. But before we do that, just a couple of quick notices for us as a church family. And the first one is this. It's quite exciting, really. On Wednesday night, we're going to have a Hope Together prayer meeting. Uh, many of you will know that we have uh, a, a prayer meeting once a month where we all get together and pray for the church and pray for God's kingdom to come in the Rhonda Valleys. And we thought we'd give it a try digitally this Wednesday. And so we're going to host a Zoom prayer meeting on Wednesday night uh, at 730 We'll send out the links via WhatsApp and we'll put it on our social media. And if you want to join us uh, to pray, we'd love to have you with us. I'm not quite sure yet how it's going to work, but we'll make a way and God will be hearing our prayers. The second notice I want to share with you is actually Lucy's going to share it with you, but we just want to encourage uh, parents in the church to really uh, continue to connect their kids into the life of Hope Church and to be really proactive with discipling them uh, and leading them to Jesus at this time. Many of us are dealing with fear and anxiety and worry and stress and all sorts of challenges in this season. And the reality is, so our kids, they also have to understand and navigate all that's going on. And Lucy's going to share with us one of the ways that we're trying to help and support the kids in our church. This is just a quick announcement to say that um, Hope Kids is still happening and has been for a few weeks. We've been using the Seesaw Class app and um, putting stories and songs and loads of activities for your kids to be getting on with uh, maybe at the same time as you watch these services or throughout the week. So I'll just um, let you know a little bit about how to use them now. This is what the app should look like for you. There are loads of stories and songs for your kids to look at. Once you've done with the songs and things, you can go and try out some of the activities on the activities button down below. And in that section, you'll find loads of things, ideas of things you can do in the house, some colouring, some word searches, stuff like that. And it is so simple to use. You just click add and then you just crack on with what it says to do. Loads of them have got voice instructions, so everyone should be able to um, understand. I think it would be so easy for kids to miss out on community during this lockdown time. And so we'd love your kids to connect. If you'd like to find out more about how you can get your child connected, please uh, send me a message and I'll make sure that they have a code to access Seesaw online. Great. Thank you so much, Lucy. I want to encourage the parents of the church to get in touch with Lucy this week. Um, We're going to spend some time now singing praise and worship to our King Jesus. And um, as we do that, I just would love you to have a couple of thoughts in your minds. The first thing I was thinking about uh, with respect to us worshipping God today was um, to do with Boris Johnson, actually, and his illness last week. Um, 
You may have seen the statement that he gave last weekend uh, where he, he, he thanked and praised the NHS. He said that he owed them his life and he'd be forever thankful because um, of the way they took care of him and, and spared his life. And I was thinking as we come to worship Jesus this morning, we should really be coming with a similar kind of attitude. Jesus, through his death on the cross and through his resurrection, has spared us from the punishment of sin and, and, is, and has offered to us the gift of everlasting life. And in light of that, we, we should come this morning, just like Boris Johnson was praising the NHS, to praise uh, King Jesus and say, Jesus, we owe you our lives. That's what worship is about. We owe you our lives and we'll be forever grateful for what you've done for us. This morning, we're going to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection because it's such good news for our lives. But the other thing I was thinking about, and I haven't been able to escape this this week because I've been thinking about today, I don't know what your experience has been, but the, the further we get into this crisis and the further we get into this lockdown, the more emotions are swirling around, the more difficult stuff and the more baggage I bring to worship this morning. Some of us will be bringing uh, worry with us. Some of us will be bringing grief with us. Some of us will be bringing anxiety about the future. Some of us will be feeling worn out by our kids. Some of us will be feeling lonely. Some of us will just be feeling fed up. And um, I just want to encourage us this morning that when we come to worship Jesus, we don't just come to celebrate the gospel, we also come to seek an encounter with him. And one of the most uh, the most uplifting things I found this week has been a couple of um, chance encounters that I've had with people from the church that I've bumped into on my travels or running errands. And just that moment of seeing somebody uh, and being able to talk to them face to face from a social distance, at least two meters apart, has been a real uh, lifter for my soul. But Jesus offers us even more than that. He said in his gospel, he said uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, he said, verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Whatever's weighing you down today, and whatever's wearing you out today, Jesus wants to have an encounter with you through his Spirit. And one of the ways we draw close to Jesus, his invitation is come. We don't have to stay far from him. We're invited to boldly approach his throne of grace. And so we can come to him. We don't have to socially distance from him. And one of the ways we do that is through worship. The, the Bible says that we enter his courts through, through thanksgiving and praise. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to draw close to Jesus. As we draw near to him, he promises to draw near to us. And as we experience that encounter, we're going to discover that he can give us rest in the depths of our souls that we desperately need in this time. As we prepare ourselves to do that now, I just want us to pray a prayer together. I'm going to read it, but you can join in with me as I pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you that you're not dead, but you are alive and seated in heaven as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you that because of your death and resurrection, we have so much to celebrate this morning. We thank you that we have hope. We thank you that we have forgiveness. We thank you that your Holy Spirit lives in us and is ministering to us today. Lord Jesus, we pray now as your people, as we draw close to you, would you be faithful in drawing close to us by your Holy Spirit? Would you strengthen us where we feel weak? Would you comfort us where we feel pain and grief? Would you encourage us where we feel discouraged? Would you reassure us where we feel worried? Would you show us again how much you care for us and love us and that you are in control. 
We pray for our brothers and sisters today in Hope Church Rhonda and around the world. Would you take their heavy burdens and give them rest? In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship God together.
From the time a few friends first gathered in a room to talk about a global partnership, the dream was fueled by the desire to help one another advance the kingdom around the world. Each church has gifts that can fortify, build, and equip the body of Christ in unique and powerful ways. And so the more connected we are, the better we are, and the greater our strength as we strengthen one another. 
We wanted to take the opportunity of this difficult season to celebrate this partnership, but also mutually encourage one another. So here are a few friendly faces from around the world. Hello, Advance family. We bring our greetings from Kathmandu Capital Church in Nepal. We are happy to be part of Advance Global Family and we often pray for you guys. We love you. Thank you very much. Hi, Advanced family. We really hope you're doing well at this time and we are sending lots of love to you from... Jubilee Community Church in the city centre of Cape Town. Hello, Advanced family. We're standing with you. Lots of love from one tribe in Nairobi, Kenya. Hello, Advanced family. We're with you and so glad that we get to celebrate together. This is Chris and Megan from Stone Church in Auburn, Washington. Hi, Advanced family and friends. We really love you and we miss you from everyday people in East London, South Africa. Hello, Advanced Family. We love you and we're with you. From Redeemer Church in London. Hi to our friends and family in advance. We love and miss you all tremendously. Um, we are from the Way in the city of Brea in Southern California. Hi, Advanced Family. We love you and are with you from all at Hope Church Rhonda in Wales. Hey, Advanced Family. We love you and we are with you from City Gates in Canada. Hello! From Antananarivo, Tana City Centre Church, Madagascar. Today the focus is Paul's letter to the Philippians and how partnership helps us to impart faith and courage to one another, especially in the midst of these trying times. So we asked a few of our brothers and sisters on the different continents to impart faith and courage to us. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Uh, it's Corey. I'm Robin. And we're with the Movement Church uh, Homestead, all the way down in Homestead, Florida. And so we appreciate having this opportunity to encourage you guys in this time. Uh, I think the thing that comes to mind for us in a moment like this is to think about Matthew. At the end of Matthew chapter 8, we see Jesus in the middle of the storm with the disciples, and they're so frightened and so scared. Uh, and he is able to control and they marvel at the fact that he controls the wind and the rain. And so I think the thing that stands out to us is that the Bible doesn't promise us that we won't have hard times and storms. What it does promise us that in the midst of those hard times, Jesus will be right there with us. And so that's the beauty. And that's what those disciples got to see. That not that Jesus just could control the winds and the waves, but that he was right there with them in the midst of it. And he'll be right there with you. God bless you guys. Hi everyone, greetings from Rigby and Sue Wallace in Cape Town, South Africa. Paul clearly has us in his sights when he encourages us in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And friends, right now we're caught between two realities present suffering in a crazy, uncertain now, and future glory in the certain and guaranteed then. Paul describes our present suffering as a light momentary affliction, and he's certainly not trivializing our pain and our sense of vulnerability. No, he's declaring a no contest between present suffering and future glory. He's simply making much, much more of the future purchased for us on Good Friday and secured for us on Easter Sunday. So friends, let's not lose heart. Hi everyone. Hi from Glasgow Grace. We've been really encouraged by the words of Ephesians 1.18 and we pray that you will be too, that the eyes of your hearts might be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which you've been called the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints. Yeah, and that's been our experience as a church through obviously quite a difficult time like it has been for all of us, we've seen people have their eyes opened and given real gospel clarity because they've been forced into thinking, well, what is most valuable to me in my life? And so people now seeing, oh man, no, that is Jesus. I do want more of him. I do want my life to be all about him. And I do know that he is the one true great hope. Hello, my dear friends, our advanced family around the world. I'm preaching from my home as we, like many of you, are in lockdown due to the coronavirus. We're going to be looking together at the opening verses of Paul's letter to the Philippians. 
It is a cheerful letter and I pray that you will all be filled with cheer today by it. Interestingly, similar to our context, the context of this letter was challenging. Paul, the author, was in prison facing possible execution. The church in Philippi, the recipients, were facing persecution. To quote Alec Mottier, the Philippian believers were tensed up, ready for the assault of a menacing world. Now, coronavirus and its various socio and economic side effects is menacing, isn't it? And it can make us tense. So I think this is truly a letter for our times. We're going to look at the opening 14 verses, which I'm calling the comfort and courage of partnership. And we will look at it in three sections. Firstly, verses 1 and 2, partners. 3 to 11, partnership. And 12 to 14, primary passion. So heading 1, partners, let's read verse 1 and 2 together. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul came from a culture that enjoyed proper introductions before saying anything of great importance, but even this two-verse introduction has important things to teach us about our identity. For example, Paul introduced himself as a servant, and if this Christ-appointed apostle, Roman citizen, brilliant scholar, thinks of himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, then certainly so should we. Now, it's important to define ourselves as servants of Christ for a myriad of reasons, not least to avoid any sense of entitlement in these somewhat confusing and difficult days. Let me back up. When we're faced with God doing or allowing something that we don't understand and that something is uncomfortable, we tend to lean either toward entitlement or worship. So we either say, Potter, what are you doing? I, the clay, don't understand, and that is unacceptable. Or we say, Father, whatever you are doing, I don't understand, and that is completely appropriate, for you are God and I am not. And I'm reminded of the Isaiah 55 gap between your ways, which are higher than my ways. And Father, I'm determined to fill this gap in my understanding with worship, not entitlement. Friends, this pandemic should humble us before God. We got this. No, we haven't. Corona has shaken the world. Remember the back end of uh, Hebrews 12, where the writer speaks of God shaking the temporary to highlight the unshakable eternal. And the writer concludes like this, therefore let us worship God with reverence and awe. No entitlement there, just pure servant attitude by the writer of Hebrews and back here in Philippians, the famous chapter two, we read that our master Jesus didn't have any sense of entitlement. In fact, he untitled himself and served us through death on a cross. Our master became a servant and us servants are not above our master. Amy Carmichael, a missionary to India for 55 years wrote, hast thou no scar, no hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star, hast thou no scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me. This corona leg of the journey has pierced our feet, hasn't it? Some of us are already quite scarred, and some of us are scratched. Friends, as the master shall our servants be unentitled Jesus imitating servants. So we're servants. We are also saints. Paul writes to all the saints, meaning all the especially set apart ones. Before beginning to teach the Philippian believers anything really, he brands them saying, you do know, don't you, that God has set you apart in Christ, secure in your salvation, never to be plucked from God's hand. I just want to check friends, that you know that also, that you are a saint, that his righteousness is now your righteousness, that the great exchange is complete, that the set apart one became sin on the cross, that us sinful ones might become set apart. We are servants, we are saints, and we're also recipients of grace. I enjoy how Paul 
blends greetings and prayers, don't you? You can call them hello prayers. It's like he walks in your front door and says, hello, it's so good to see you. Oh, might you know the grace and peace from the Father and the Son? A question, where will you find grace and peace in these difficult days? CNN, BBC, News 24, Facebook, blogs, I expect not, but I know you will from the Father and Son. You have direct personal access to them, log in to them more than any other source for grace and peace. And last, in this introduction, we learn that we are partners. Uh, he explicitly calls them partners in verse 5, but he does a quick who's who here. And first, our senior partner at Jesus is head over the church. Not an abstract, out of touch chairman, but he holds us together, causing us to throb with his life, his spirit, his comfort, his courage. And then we've got Paul and uh, Timothy working to strengthen the church from the outside. New Testament churches were meaningfully connected with other churches and with ministers like Paul, Timothy, Silas, Apollos, Barnabas, Priscilla and Aquila, Lydia, John Mark and so on. All of them working from the outside to comfort, encourage and equip local churches. And also catching them up on a wider mission. And our global partnership helps with that too, doesn't it? Not just strengthening us, but lifting our gaze and enlarging our horizon of mission. I'm going to talk more about that at the end. And then last, there are saints and elders or overseers and deacons inside the church. Local congregations like yours consisting of leaders and followers in gospel partnership together. And it's a beautiful multifaceted partnership, isn't it? All of us partnering with Jesus, partnership between uh, churches and then partnership within churches, believer to believer. Okay, we're going to read on now, part two, and learn more about these wonderful gospel partnerships. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, the first thing we learn about partnership is that you know when you're in it. In verse 5, Paul says that their partnership started on an actual day. Um, your partnership as a member of your local church started on the day that you became a member of that church. Our partnership together in advance started the day your church became a partner church of advance. And this word partner is terrific. It's like a stake in the heart to consumer Christianity, isn't it? That you're not a congregant of your church, you're a partner. You're involved. Our churches are not recipients of advance. We are advance. Believer to believer in our churches and church to church partnerships. We're not parasites. We're productive. We're not passive. We're contributing together. Uh, I was on a Zoom call recently. I'm sure you've been on many of those uh, in the last few weeks. I was talking to various advance leaders um, in our region of America, and we're all giving news. And then it came time for Joe from uh, Raleigh in North Carolina to give his news, and he set the screen alight. It was beautiful to watch and listen to him boasting about his congregation as not a congregation, congregating, but as an active army together partnering in the advance of the gospel, even in these difficult uh, corona times. Uh, a little while ago, uh, we needed to raise some money pretty urgently, a large sum, for a crisis that had hit in India and Nepal. And we were anticipating having to pass the hat round uh, all the way around the world. But just the first two groups of churches that we passed the hat to 
uh, gave so generously that we didn't need to raise any money uh, beyond that for this particular cause. And I was delighted in my heart. I thought, man, we are owning this together. It's not them advance. This is us and we're in this together, partnering continent to continent. Okay, moving on. A second hallmark of partnership is that we get to impart courage to each other. Certainly that's what Paul uh, did to them in verse 6. He said, I want you to be sure of this, because I'm sure of this, that he who began the good work in you will complete it. The one who started your salvation will see your salvation through. And friends, at different times, all of us are going to need to hear some partner say this to us. It might be someone in your family or your small group. It might be someone from across the world by video reminding you that your salvation was started by God. Your salvation is being kept by God and it will be completed by God. And the devil is a spectacularly good discourager. And we need to put this kind of courage and faith about the security of our salvation into one another like Paul did. I was painting my deck recently and my son Jack said to me, Dad, is this paint cosmetic or protective? And I said, no, no, it's protective. And we need layers of, of, of protective paint put on us in, in this kind of form of courage and confidence in our salvation. It's not just a cos cosmetic thing. This is right at the heart of our faith. Christ started it. He will complete it. I have a friend called Pete Dreyer, and we used to pray together many years ago, many times. Pete was always the guy who would start the song. In the, you know, it's often one of those in a prayer group, isn't there, that just lifts the whole tone of faith. Pete, again and again, his go-to default song that he would start was, What a faithful God have I, what a faithful God. And he's a giant. I mean, he's about eight foot and his chest is about five foot wide. And he had such deep resonant tones. And it was like coat after coat of protective paint on me that is still, still on me today. That I have a faithful God. He started my salvation. He will complete it. This theme of God owning our salvation and keeping us is big in Philippians. In, in chapter 3, verse 12, Paul talks about laying hold of all things Christ because Christ has laid hold of him. In uh, Philippians 2, uh, th uh, 13, uh, the famous verse when Paul says, work out your salvation because God is working in you. He's working his salvation in you. I remember I was uh, on a trip uh, strengthening a church in South Africa and Sheshi Kaniki, who's now in Dar es Salaam with his wonderful wife, Trudy, and uh, sons, Josh, Timothy and Daniel. Hey, guys, big shout out to you. Much love to you. Shesh and I were traveling together and overnight the wind, the windshield, the windscreen uh, on our vehicle froze because we're in a very mountainous, cold part of South Africa. And uh, Shesh said to me the next morning, should I pour hot water on the windshield to get the ice off. And um, I didn't have much more experience than Shesh in cold climates, but a little bit more. And I said, oh no, don't do that. Don't, don't try and warm it up from the outside. Just start the car. Here are the keys, Shesh. Just go and start the car and let it run for a few minutes. And the ice on the outside will melt because of the heat on the inside. Do you see where I'm going with this? God's work, God's heat is on the inside of us. Don't try, and, uh, me don't try and melt your stubborn heart from the outside. Look to God's working within you and then you work out your salvation. Lay hold of Christ-like things certain in the knowledge that Christ has laid hold of you. God started your salvation. He will keep it and he will complete it. Amen. Uh, next privilege of partnership. We see Paul sharing affection with them. And we get to do that to one another as well. Verse 7, he says, It's right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. And verse 8, For God is my witness, I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Friends, let us abhor corporate church. Let us pursue family church. Remember, the primary description of God is Father. And fittingly, the primary description of the church is family. Let us be that. I thank God for the mega church season from the 80s through to recently. It's still going on. I've got no problem with big churches. I love big churches. But mega church mindset has left us with a few things that we need to be careful 
we don't uh, embrace. And they're three Ps. Um, the place can sometimes be more important than a lifestyle. Um, the person who leads the church can sometimes be more important than the priesthood of all believers. It, this is in, in sort of classic mega church, unhelpful mega church. And then the third P, a place person, the third P is programs uh, replacing family feel and uh, genuine discipleship in the Lord. And I would encourage us all not, not to go near those three Ps, certainly enjoy the place where we meet, certainly honour the one and those that lead us, and certainly let's have some healthy programmes. But apart from that, keep those in its right place. Let's have a wonderful family loving feel. Maybe each of us in this corona season can just turn up the love volume. Each of us turn up the love volume of our lives a couple of notches, then the whole sounds uh, from the church of love will go up. Uh, Another thing Paul does and that we can imitate in is in our partnership, that's you, your believers in your church and us in our worldwide partnership, let's help calibrate one another to Christ's return. Verse 6 and verse 10, he speaks of the day of Christ, uh, the, the, the day of Christ Jesus. And friends, we must help one another like Paul is helping the Philippians. Keep our personal center of gravity more in the next life than this one. I recently, just a week ago, got a, uh, an email from a wonderful lady in our church. Her and her husband, their family, have been through significant loss, Bere bereavement, real difficult years. And I was just checking in with her saying, hey, how are you doing? I know it's not an easy time of year for you as you're remembering. And uh, she replied, lovely email, and she said at the end, Thanks again, PJ. I'm really looking forward to heaven. See you soon. And she signed her name. Her center of gravity is more in the next life than this one. Got another friend uh, known to many of us in our church. He's, he's called D. Jones and uh, he's an older man now and he's been battling cancer for several years. He's like the guy, he's like Robert Duvall in Secondhand Lions, but like a, a Christian believing version. Uh, you remember Robert Duvall in Secondhand Lions, he gives the speech to young men about what it means to be a man. And D is just rough and tough and loves Jesus. And he's really sick and struggling now. But each time that I've gone round to see him, he hasn't sucked sympathy from me. He's charged me. He's, he, says, he says, PJ, keep your eyes on your wife, not any other woman. I go, okay. He says, and love your boys. Make sure you give them enough attention. I go, okay. He says, and love Jesus and lead his church. I go, yes, D. He's an older man who's charging me. But this is a man who's got his center of gravity more in the next life than this one. Look at this uh, picture here of D. He's holding up a sign, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, about the momentary afflictions of this life being far outweighed by the glory uh, of the next. We all need D. Jones. Is in our lives, in our churches, in our partnerships, who keep us from obsessing about today and help us obsess about that great day. I've actually just blogged on this whole topic of the afterlife, death, hell, heaven, to help us keep our center of gravity more in the next life than this one. You can check it out on my website if you like. And finally, prayer is a huge part of partnership. Uh, Paul mentions it several times, verse 4 and verse 9. It's my prayer, every prayer of mine, my prayer for you with joy. I love our growing culture of prayer across our partnership. I'm so proud of all our churches that are committing increasingly to prayer. Prayer is the ultimate sign that we really do believe that unless the Lord builds the house, those who labour, labour in vain. Um, I was in India and Nepal a little while back and I was preaching to maybe 500 people uh, through an interpreter. And you know what it's like? People who are listening to you, they can pick up the odd English word. They don't need to wait for the interpreter to translate it. Um, and I was talking, talking, and then I mentioned, I said something like, so let's, so we need to be praying for that. And I was actually meaning generally and in the future, we need to remember that situation in prayer. But as soon as the people, the Nepalese and Indian people heard me say in English, we need to be praying for that. And they knew what I was talking about because I'd just spoken about it. Before the translator had even uh, translated it, this wall 
of noise. It was like a it was like a wave of prayer just grew in the room, and it knocked me. I mean, not physically, but in my spirit was knocked, and they just started praying. We had to take a little break, a prayer break. Everyone just I wasn't even meaning they should pray then and there. And I was so helped by that. This their default option was to pray. You hear, let's let's pray. Let's pray. Prayer keeps us free from burdens that are not ours but the Lord's to carry. It keeps us focused on what is truly important. Prayer keeps us soft-hearted yet thick-skinned. It causes despair to yield to hope and it stokes the fires of faith. Andrew Murray said, By prayer, the church on earth has at its disposal the powers of the heavenly world. Well, there are several other glorious truths that uh, we could look at in this passage, but I want to rush on to section three to look about the uh, primary passion that Paul had. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Maybe you, like Paul, feel that you're in a prison of some sort at the moment and that the way we do church and mission and evangelism has suddenly been arrested and put in chains. Friends like Paul, of this corona season, I do believe that we will come to say that what happened to us has really served to advance the gospel. Just three brief thoughts on this. First, let's bring the gospel to those we are in contact with. So for Paul, it was the imperial guard. Who's your imperial guard? Family? Neighbours? Second, Bring the gospel more courageously than ever before. I think Corona has been oil on the rusty hinges of some stubborn hearts. Let us not say, yet four months until the harvest, lift up your eyes. The fields are white unto harvest now. And third, let us in our churches and in our worldwide advanced partnership keep mission front and centre. Paul's lens through which he viewed good times and bad was mission. He says what has happened has really served to advance the gospel. So what was happening was not as important to Paul as whether the mission was happening. So friends, no matter how long this corona disruption lasts, we need to keep planting and strengthening churches around the world. Do you remember how at the end of uh, Romans, uh, after 14 chapters of strengthening them with <laughs> incredible doctrine, Paul says, hey, and we've got to get the gospel to Spain. Friends, we got to get the gospel to your neighbours and to the nations of the world in our generation. And we've had good success in this regard together. Uh, to mention just three out of many church plants, by God's grace, through our partnership, we now have a church in Nairobi, Kenya, that didn't exist three years ago. We've got a church in Glasgow, Scotland, that didn't exist a year ago. And we've got a church in Triorki in South Wales that didn't exist but months ago. We need hundreds more churches planted in our generation. I'm reminded of the story in World War II when someone was raising money for the Red Cross, a health organization, and they went to Texas and speaking to just a few poor people in a town hall said, we need bandages and we need crutches. And then a well-known multi-millionaire Texan came in at the back and the presenter immediately changed gear and said, and we need helicopters and we need hospital ships. We need ambulances. Friends, we're coming to a big God. Let us come with big requests for one another in our churches, for evangelism in our communities and for our partnership around the world. We're going to have a few brothers and sisters now lead us in prayer. Much love to you and God bless you. We're so encouraged by this theme of partnership. Our hearts are reaching out to our friends around the world, longing for the day when we can actually physically be together again, but so grateful that we're united by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can come to you knowing that you are going to advance your gospel in these days, just as you've done from the very moment that you rose again. 
Thank you that we can come to you confidently asking you for more of the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can be your bold witnesses in partnership across the globe. Lord, would you please use us at this time in these extraordinary days to be faithful witnesses to you. Amen. I would like to encourage you from Nehemiah 8 verse 10. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I believe that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The strength for Christ followers around the world, the strength for church leaders around the world. Please join me as we pray. I want to pray for God's strength for you. Dear Lord, I thank you for you are the God who is in control. Lord, I pray for strength for your sons and daughters around the world. Lord, I pray for courage and boldness, and I pray for your favor and your grace to rest upon your church. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Father, we thank you that you are steadfast. We thank you that your kingdom cannot be shaken. We thank you that you are good and you are sovereign. And so, Lord, we ask that as we remember all that you have done and all that you continue to do, we would have trust and faith and boldness. Would your kingdom come? Would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? In Jesus' name. Father, we lament during this season that as we are exercising wisdom and love and care of our neighbors by socially distancing God, you call us to be salt and light and we are not able to interact with those around us in the ways that you call us to. And so, Lord, we ask that you would quicken the time for us to be released from the, the, this virus and the impact of it. And Lord, uh, in the meantime, would you be preparing your army? Lord, would you teach us and train us? Would you increase in us our character as well as boldness and courage? that once you open things up again, that we might begin to advance against the enemy once again, that his gates will not be able to prevail against us. And in the meantime, would you grant us patience and endurance and perseverance? And we just trust you that you are in control of all things. And it's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Friends, I really hope that you've been encouraged through PJ's message uh, from Philippians chapter 1. We need each other, don't we? We need to partner together in the gospel. We can't exist as islands, as individuals on our own uh, in this world as Christians. That's not the way God has designed us. He's designed us to work together, to partner together in the gospel for the good of our own lives and for the good of the advancement of God's kingdom. And I want to encourage us just at the end of this message in our partnership together as households of faith and as Hope Church Rhonda in these difficult days. The stress and the pressure and the burden of being in lockdown can make life difficult and can make re relationships difficult too. And um, I was just thinking about how in our households with our families, actually this is a really testing time. But we need to partner together in the gospel. Husbands, we need our wives. Wives, we need our husbands. Parents, I want to encourage you to disciple and love your kids and lead them through this season, leading them towards God every single day. We also need one another as a church family. And so I want to charge us just at the end of this time, as we think about partnering together in this season, even though we're apart from one another, I want to charge us with some verses from Romans chapter 12. Let these verses rule over our households and over our church family in the week that is to come. Romans chapter 12 verse 9 from the NLT. Don't just pretend to love one another, to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. 
love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honourable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. I'd love to just encourage us at the end of this time together, would you just think and pray, how can I put Romans 12 into action? How can I be a good partner in the gospel in my household and in Hope Church Rhonda in these difficult days? I'm just going to pray for us for the week ahead as we close. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are ruling and reigning over everything today. And we want this week that is ahead of us, no matter what comes our way, no matter how difficult it might be, we want to live lives that honour you and please you. And so, Jesus, I want to pray for our partnership in the gospel. Will you help us to express partnership together in meaningful ways? Would we love uh, those in our household really well? Would we show the fruit of the Spirit towards them this week? Will we be patient and kind? Will we speak to build up, not to tear down? I pray, Jesus, for our partnership as a church. Would you show us ways that we can strengthen one another and show kindness and love and hospitality towards one another? Would we be prayerful for one another this week? Will we encourage one another and build one another up through the power of your Spirit? And we pray, Jesus, for our brothers and sisters around the world and particularly those in our partnership in advance, God. We pray for their flourishing. We pray for their protection. We pray, God, that you'd use us in these days to advance your kingdom. Would you give us opportunities to talk about the hope that we have? In Jesus' precious name, amen. Guys, have a great week. I just can't wait for until we can all be back together in one place. Uh, but until then, let's keep doing all that we can to stand together in faith in these days. God bless you.